Well, good morning, Little Masters, and welcome back to today's Tolkien Times. I'm the Man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony podcast. Let's wrap up this first week of the second series of episodes with a Silmarillion Saturday. Now, these Saturdays are our chance to revisit the history and legends of the Elder Days, whether from the Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, or more. At the end of the last series, we read about Aule and the creation of the dwarves, followed by Yavanna and the beginnings of the Ents and Eagles. Today, though, I want to go back to one of my personal favorite moments in all of the Legendarium, Hurin's last stand from the Silmarillion. And we're going to build up to that moment. And we're going to start in chapter 18 of the Ruin of Beleriand. Now, we're picking up where Hurin and Huor have just been dropped off by the Eagle Airline Express to uh, the city of Gondolin. There, Turgon the king received them well when he learned of their kin, for messages and dreams had come to him up Sirion from the sea, from Ulmo, lord of waters, warning him of woe to come, and counseling him to deal kindly with the sons of the house of Hador, from whom help should come to him at need. Hurin and Huor dwelt as guests in the king's house for well nigh a year, and it is said that in this time Hurin learned much lore of the elves, and understood also something of the counsels and purposes of the king. For Turgon took great liking for the sons of Galdor, and spoke much with them. And he wished indeed to keep them in Gondolin out of love, and not only for his law that no stranger, be he elf or man, who found the way to the secret kingdom and looked upon the city, should ever depart again, until the king should open the leaguer and the hidden people should come forth. But Hurin and Huor desired to return to their own people, and share in the wars and griefs that now beset them. And Hurin said to Turgon, Lord, we are but mortal men, and unlike the Eldar. They may endure for long years awaiting battle with their enemies in some far distant day, but for us the time is short, and our hope and strength soon wither. Moreover, we did not find the road to Gondolin, and indeed we do not know surely where this city stands, for we were brought in fear and wonder by the high ways of the air and in mercy our eyes were veiled. Then Turgon granted his prayer, and he said, By the way that you came, you have leave to depart, if Thrandor is willing. I grieve at this parting. Yet in a little while, as the Eldar count it, we may meet again. Later on we read, When seven years had passed since the fourth battle, Morgoth renewed his assault, and he sent a great force against Hithlam. The attack on the passes of the shadowy mountains was bitter, and in the siege of Aethel Sirion, Galdor the Tall, lord of Dorlomen, was slain by an arrow. That fortress he held on behalf of Fingon, the high king, and in that same place his father, Hador Lorendal, died but a little time before. Hurin, his son, was then newly come to manhood, but he was great in strength, both of mind and body, and he drove the orcs with heavy slaughter from Ered Wethrin and pursued them far across the sands of Anfauglith. But King Fingon was hard put to it to hold back the army of Angband that came down from the north, and battle was joined upon the very plains of Hithlam. There Fingon was outnumbered, but the ships of Círdan sailed in great strength up the firth of Drengist, and in the hour of need the elves of the Phalas came up upon the host of Morgoth from the west. Then the orcs broke and fled, and the Eldar had their victory and their horsed archers pursued them even into the Iron Mountains. Thereafter, Hurin, son of Galdor, ruled the house of Hador in Doromen, and served Fingon. Hurin was of less stature than his father's, or his son after him, but he was tireless and enduring in body, lithe and swift after the manner of his mother's kin, Harith of the Haladin. His wife was Morwen Elithwen, daughter of Baragund of the house of Beor. Later still, in chapter 20, we then read, But now a cry went up, passing up the wind from the south from vale to vale, and elves and men lifted their voices in wonder and joy. For unsummoned and unlooked for, Turgon had opened the leaguer of Gondolin and was come with an army ten thousand strong, with bright mail and long swords and spears like a forest. Then, when Fingon heard afar the great trumpet of Turgon his brother, the shadow passed, and his heart was uplifted, and he shouted aloud, Utulian aure, aya eldalie arataratari, Utulian aure. The day has come. Behold, people of the Eldar, and fathers of men, the day has come. 
And all those who heard his great voice echo in the hills answered, crying, Out to Elome, the night is passing. Now Morgoth, who knew much of what was done and designed by his enemies, chose his hour. And trusting in his treacherous servants to hold back Mithras and prevent the union of his foes, he sent a force seeming great, and yet part of all that he had made ready, towards Hithlam. And they were clad all in dun raiment and showed no naked steel, and thus were already far over the sands of Anfaugleth before their approach was seen. Then the hearts of the Noldor grew hot, and their captains wished to assail their foes upon the plain, but Hurin spoke against it and bade them beware of the guile of Morgoth, whose strength was always greater than it seemed, and his purpose other than he revealed. And though the signal of the approach of Mithras came not, and the host grew impatient, Hurin urged them still to await it, and to let the orcs break themselves in assault upon the hills. Later in that chapter we read, Then in the plain of Anfaugleth, on the fourth day of the war, there began Nirnaeth Arnoidiad unnumbered tears, for no song or tale can contain all its grief. The host of Fingon retreated over the sands, and Haldir, lord of the Haladin, was slain in the rear guard. With him fell most of the men of Brethil, and came never back to their woods. But on the fifth day, as night fell and they were still far from Eredwethrin, the orcs surrounded the host of Hithlam, and they fought until day pressed ever closer. In the morning came hope, when the horns of Turgon were heard as he marched up with the main host of Gondolin, for they had been stationed southward guarding the pass of Sirion, and Turgon restrained most of his people from the rash onslaught. Now he hastened to the aid of his brother, and the Gondolindrim were strong and clad in mail, and their ranks shone like a river of steel in the sun. Now the phalanx of the guard of the king broke through the ranks of the orcs, and Turgon hewed his way to the side of his brother. And it is told that the meeting of Turgon with Hurin, who stood beside Fingon, was glad in the midst of battle. Then hope was renewed in the hearts of the elves. And in that very time, at the third hour of morning, the trumpets of Mithras were heard at last coming up from the east, and the banners of the sons of Feanor assailed the enemy in the rear. Some have said that even then the Eldar might have won the day, had all their hosts proved faithful. For the orcs wavered and their onslaught was stayed, and already some were turning to flight. But even as the vanguard of Mithras came upon the orcs, Morgoth loosed his last strength, and Angband was emptied. There came wolves and wolf riders, and there came Balrogs and dragons, and Glaurung, father of dragons. The strength and terror of the great worm were now great indeed, and elves and men withered before him, and he came between the hosts of Mithras and Fingon and swept them apart. Now all of that was prologue for this moment that you all knew was coming. But now in the western battle, Fingon and Turgon were assailed by a tide of foes thrice greater than all the force that was left to them. Gothmog, Lord of Balrogs, High Captain of Angband, was come, and he drove a dark wedge between the elven hosts, surrounding King Fingon and thrusting Turgon and Hurin aside towards the fen of Serek. Then he turned upon Fingon. That was a grim meeting. At last, Fingon stood alone with his guard dead about him, and he fought with Gothmog, until another Balrog came behind and cast a thong of fire about him. Then Gothmog hewed him with his black axe, and a white flame sprang up from the helm of Fingon as it was cloven. Thus fell the high king of the Noldor, and they beat him into the dust with their maces, and his banner, blue and silver, they trod into the mire of his blood. The field was lost, but still Hurin and Huor and the remnant of the house of Hador stood firm with Turgon of Gondolin, and the hosts of Morgoth could not yet win the pass of Sirion. Then Hurin spoke to Turgon, saying, Go now, Lord, while time is, for in you lives the last hope of the Eldar, and while Gondolin stands, Morgoth shall still know fear in his heart. But Turgon answered, Not long now can Gondolin be hidden, and being discovered, it must fall. Then Huor spoke and said, Yet if it stands but a little while, then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men. 
This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death. Though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again, from you and from me a new star shall arise. Farewell. And Maeglin, Turgon's sister's son, who stood by, heard these words and did not forget them, but he said nothing. Then Turgon took the counsel of Hurin and Huor, and summoning all that remained of the host of Gondolin and such of Fingon's people as could be gathered, he retreated towards the pass of Sirion, and his captains Ecthelion and Glorfindel guarded the flanks to right and left, so that none of the enemy should pass them by. But the men of Dorlomen held the rear guard as Hurin and Huor desired, for they did not wish in their hearts to leave the Northlands, and if they could not win back to their homes, there they would stand to the end. Thus was the treachery of Uldor redressed, and of all the deeds of war that the fathers of men wrought in behalf of the Eldar, the last stand of the men of Dorlomen is most renowned. So it was that Turgon fought his way southward, until coming behind the guard of Hurin and Huor, he passed down Sirion and escaped, and he vanished into the mountains and was hidden from the eyes of Morgoth. But the brothers drew the remnant of the men of the house of Hador about them, and foot by foot they withdrew, until they came behind the fen of Serek, and had the stream of Rivil before them. There they stood, and gave way no more. Then all the hosts of Angband swarmed against them, and they bridged the stream with their dead, and encircled the remnant of Hithlam as a gathering tide about a rock. There, as the sun westered on the sixth day, and the shadow of Ered Wethrin grew dark, Huor fell pierced with a venomed arrow in his eye, and all the valiant men of Hador were slain about him in a heap. And the orcs hewed their heads and piled them as a mound of gold in the sunset. Last of all, Hurin stood alone. Then he cast aside his shield and wielded an axe two-handed, and it is sung that the axe smoked in the black blood of the troll guard of Gothmog until it withered, and each time that he slew, Hurin cried, Aure and Tuluva, day shall come again. Seventy times he uttered that cry, but they took him at last alive by the command of Morgoth, for the orcs grappled him with their hands, which clung to him still, though he hewed off their arms, and ever their numbers were renewed, until at last he fell buried beneath them. Then, Gothmog bound him and dragged him to Angband with mockery. Thus ended Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, as the sun went down beyond the sea. Now I hope you'll forgive the much longer reading today. This is such a powerful set of passages and contains my absolute favorite Tolkien quote, Aure in Tuluva, day shall come again. Now we can't get there without a little work. Next week, we're going to see Hurin's courage as he faces off against the mightiest being to ever walk on Middle-earth in the words of Hurin and Morgoth. But that does wrap it up, eventually, for today's Silmarillion Saturday. Come back for more of the Elder Days every Saturday as we open up the pages of Middle-earth history. And if there is a first or second age story you want to hear me read and discuss, please let me know by emailing barlaman at theprancingponypodcast.com. For a deeper dive into Tolkien, listen to the Prancing Pony podcast, my award-winning show with more than seven years working our way through the Legendarium, including the first 50 or so episodes just on the Silmarillion. And I think there's probably an episode with at least a half an hour discussing this one moment. Now, speaking of the Prancing Pony podcast, be sure to check out the new episode tomorrow. Matt from the Nerd of the Rings and I finish our walkthrough of the Black Gate Opens and put the finishing touches on season seven of the Prancing Pony podcast. Finally, join me again next Monday as we start another week of today's Tolkien Times with Mailbag Monday. Please like and subscribe on YouTube, follow or subscribe on your podcast apps, and follow at Tolkien Times on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And finally, as Faramir says, go with the goodwill of all good men. <laughs> <laughs>